If you should visit a place with a big horror movie tapestry on the wall and too many license games, then you may also find a nerdy little loser named Chase Plays. He doesn't know many people, and nobody knows him. Who the fuck said that? When he's not crying in his shower or subjecting himself to constant torture, <laughs> this game sucks. He's sitting in his chair and talking about pieces of media that nobody asked him to talk about. This game sucks. This game sucks. This isn't even a game. I'll get back to you. One day, Chase sat down in his chair deciding to talk about one of his favorite childhood programs, Thomas the Tank Engine. Hello everybody, my name is Chase here and uh, what he said. Most people, when they think about Thomas, imagine that dumb kid show with the talking trains with weird non-moving faces that would come on after Barney the Dinosaur that parents would plop their kids in front of so they didn't have to be parents for a few hours. Or you know it from all the people trying to paint the show like it's creepy and scary. Yeah, I still hate that. But what if I told you that the original show is really good. Like, way better than it had any right to be. So much that I would say you can still enjoy it as an adult. And sure, that probably has a lot to do with nostalgia. I was practically raised on Thomas. I had a million VHSs and DVDs of the old seasons that I would watch repeatedly until my fucking eyes bled. I had almost every toy being sold at the time. Even if they didn't last long in my hands, because I like to try to recreate scenes in the sandbox with the hose. Let's just say that Percy went out of commission fast. I had never seen anything like it, and to be honest, I still haven't. There was just something so casual captivating about it. It gave me this feeling that no other piece of media has ever been able to recreate. That sense of whimsy, the scope, the sheer destruction, that one especially. But even then, I genuinely believe that even if you don't have nostalgia for it, you can still find something to like about Thomas and his friends. I mean, you like trains? C Consume. But I also like simple, well-told stories, and that's something that it has in spades. I don't think you'll ever find a more well-written children's show. It comes from how much they respect their audience and not dumb down what's being made. There are a lot of characters that have distinct personalities that they very rarely deviate from, giving them fun interactions with the others. Why, James? I'm the one who needs a new coat. Look at me. I'd rather not. Jordan James, you're not a pleasant sight and wouldn't understand the needs of a really important engine. And as the series goes on, they experience new trials and issues that change them and allow them to grow to the point where seasons later, they feel like they grew up and matured. I know shows made for adults that can't get that right. I can't think of any other kids programming with multi-season wide arcs for every single one of its main characters and allows time to pass. That is wild considering the amount of characters they had to use. They even reward you for continuing to watch by having a strong continuity. When a bridge breaks, it stays broken even when it's not the focus. Focus. When a character grows or goes through a major change, they stay that way. It's just well realized and doesn't feel like they're talking down to you and have the confidence to use terms that most might not even understand, because they respect your intelligence to still get what's important in the story. Sure, the trains can talk, but other than that, it feels like a railway that could really exist and feels lived in and alive. That's because most of these stories were based on real railway incidents. You can tell that the people who made this had a lot of respect for the railroad. And it's also really funny. Your color's nice, James. Pity about your face, though said a freight car. And do I need to even mention how gorgeous it is? Later on, they would completely switch the show to be fully 3D animated, and it never managed to have the charm and beauty of the props on the real sets. Some of these shots look like they came out of a painting or a storybook. These big, beautiful landscapes make this world feel like it has so much wonder. And who doesn't love watching the huge crash sequences that were all done completely practically? And this was with the budget of one shoestring. The first season was filmed in essentially one garage. It's very rare that you see children's programming have so much passion behind its creation, and it's something that I can't help but appreciate and love even up until now. And the music. By God, the music. I could talk about this aspect of the series for an hour by itself, but I'll keep it short. The composers gave every single major character a musical theme to go with them, and every location too. The stories hardly even need narration, you can understand it all from just the music cues. And it's been memed to death, but can you think of a more iconic opening theme song? Why on God's earth did they change it later on? They had struck gold! Everything about this show is just so good, and I feel like a raving lunatic talking about it because nobody's gonna to believe me. They haven't felt what I've felt or seen what I've seen. And I have a funny feeling that I'm not going to be able to prove it by just talking about it generally. So instead, I'm going to talk about the episodes I think you should watch if you want to see the best of what Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends has to offer. And I'm going to do it in a top 10 format because I like views. I'm a whore.
Couple of ground rules before we get started. First of all, I'm only counting episodes from the first five seasons for this list. I've always viewed the different eras of Thomas like an artist's run in comics. Seasons one to seven are the original run and everything that came after those I would never consider. Seasons six and seven are part of the classic run and I do like them, but if I'm being honest, I don't think any episodes qualify for this list. I also know that way later down the line, the show got different writers, changed animation studios, and got really good for a couple of seasons, but I haven't seen those yet, so I can't count any episodes. Second rule is that this list is going to be less of which are my personal favorites and more ones I think are the best and you should watch if you're thinking of giving the show a shot for yourself. But not to worry, there's a lot of overlap. Also, picking the episodes that I think are the best from one of my favorite TV shows wasn't that easy. Not everything could make it, so keep that in mind. And finally, all episodes here will be presented in their US dub because I'm a filthy American and let's be honest, if you don't want George Carlin narrating your talking train stories, you have something wrong with you. Blow it out your ass! <laughs> Thomas and Birdie's Great Race. Following some mishaps with some snow in the previous episode, Thomas gets into a disagreement with a bus named Birdie and who can go faster. So the two decide to settle the conflict by racing each other to the last station on Thomas's branch line. And that's about it. Incredibly simple premise, but one they managed to make super engaging to watch simply through the visual aspect of watching real life models collide across the set. This kind of story really only works when you look as good as Thomas the Tank Engine. Really, the visuals speak for themselves. They get to show off some of the best sets that the first season had to offer. Some of the most iconic shots of the entire show are from this episode given they were used for the opening theme song. It would feel almost wrong to not consider it as one of the very best, considering that most people who have seen it remember it. This episode gets referenced all the time in the show, far into the classic series, creating that nice continuity. Wanna race Thomas beat Birdie? Never mind. There's not much more to say about it other than it's a classic episode that deserves to be here. And I'll never get tired of hearing Birdie's theme. In fact, that's a great way to look at it. It's an episode that I never really get tired of no matter how many times I see it. Well done, Thomas, said Birdie. That was fun. But to beat you over that hill, I should have to grow wings and be an airplane. Rusty and the Boulder. High up in the mountains sits a giant boulder creepily peering down on the rest of the railway. One day, while workmen are attempting to build a quarry in the cliffs, the boulder comes loose and chases down the narrow gauge engines Indiana Jones style, ending in a giant fucking explosion after it crashes into the shed at the end of the line. Sir Topham Hatt concedes that this event was a bad omen and decides to leave that part of the island alone, relocating boulder to another cliff where it can continue to look down and be scary to anyone who sees it. Why does it have a face sometimes? I couldn't really tell you. Rusty and the boulder came out of season five and something very important to know about this season is that it was fucking insane. This is when they stopped adapting railway series books and started writing their own stories, and because of that, the fifth season was very experimental and action-packed with some of its episodes. And it was fucking awesome! It gave us some of the most incredible crashes and the most elaborate sequences imaginable. It felt like they had taken off the power cuffs and got cracking to make sure you weren't gonna forget this shit. This team clearly loved playing with tone and pushing the boundaries of what they could make. They would take these incredibly ridiculous ideas and take them in such an interesting direction. It's really interesting seeing them take a concept that would normally play up the disaster aspect of it and focus on the supernatural side of the coin. Not only is the explosion at the end surprising to see, but it also feels unsettling, especially with Sir Topham Hat considering it a bad omen. We should have left this part of the island alone. Like how many kids shows would do that? Make me question my existence, Dora. The boulder feels like a true threat even when it's stationary. When you see it come loose and start barreling after the engines, it feels intense. They're forced to crash just to avoid being flattened. Better a smash than a squash. And there's something about the way the narrator describes the boulder. It makes it feel otherworldly, almost like it's its own character. Must he assure that on a clear night, it is gazing up at the mountain and that its sighs are being carried on the wind to where it once used to stand proud and silent. I wonder if Rusty is right, don't you?
saved from scrap. On a trip to the scrapyard to pick up some old parts, Edward comes across an old traction engine named Trevor, who will be broken up in the upcoming weeks as he's seen as too old-fashioned by his owner. And feeling sorry for the poor engine, both Edward and his crew do everything they can to stop it from happening. Which, thank God, ends with Trevor getting purchased by the Vicarage Orchard, where he can live happily, be useful again, and give rides to children. Engines having to be scrapped is an idea that Thomas showcased a lot, even when the show got shitty. It was a very dark and grim idea that was always treated very seriously. Some characters can't even bear to hear the word because they're almost scrapped themselves. And you and he have a lot in common, too. We do, quizzed Douglas. And what would that be? Scrap said Edward quietly. Don't mention that word! It makes me wheels wobble! And this would be the first episode to introduce the concept to kids. It's an episode that deals with a very depressing subject matter, but manages to still feel heartwarming, and because of that, it always stuck out to me as a kid. There's no other way to cut it. The idea that one day these engines will eventually outgrow their usefulness and need to be scrapped is grim as fuck. I hope you like seeing Thomas, kids, because he's, he's gonna, gonna die, die one day! But I think it helps make Thomas's world feel more real. I mean, engines being scrapped happens all the time in real life, especially around the time the show takes place. And because of that, it happens here too. And Trevor is just clearly a nice guy who you feel so bad for in this scenario. All this guy wants is to live peacefully and give rides to children. So to see him all rusted up and almost fine with the fact that he's gonna die next week is so sad. They managed to get you so attached to this little guy in the span of a minute. And using someone like Edward, who is known for being old but still hardworking, makes it feel very well Put together. He relates to his situation. My driver says I only need some paint, polish, and oil to be as good as new, but my owner says I'm old fashioned. People say I'm old fashioned, but I don't care. Sir Topham Hatt says I'm a useful engine. One of Thomas's most grim yet wholesome episodes, and it's one of my personal favorites. While taking a midnight goods train to a faraway part of the island, Douglas comes across a lost engine named Oliver and his brake van Toad, who are escaping from British railways to avoid being scrapped. And after being inspired by Edward saving Trevor in his own experience of almost being scrapped, he decides to help Oliver escape the scrapyard, where the fat controller gives him a new coat of paint and gives him a new home on Duck's branch line, getting dubbed the Little Western. I almost see this episode as a part two to Saved from Scrap, given how much they play into each other thematically. There, Edward saves Trevor from scrap, an event that manages to inspire another engine to do the same. It really goes to show how one good deed can do more than you think. When you help someone, you help everyone. I do think it's funny that usually when new characters get introduced, they just kind of show up. We need another engine because who else is going to do this work? Capitalism is capitalizing. But Oliver gets this grand introduction that makes his addition to the cast feel so significant. He's always been one of my favorite characters and one that is so sad to see go when they chuck the extended cast into the trash. And ugh, the music. Oliver's theme might be my favorite piece of music Mike and Jr. ever composed. And this is easily the best rendition of it. Escape is very iconic for the series, and definitely one of the episodes I would recommend to show you how Thomas is different than you probably think it is. It's adventurous, well told, and sticks with you forever. One of the best. Duck and Oliver are happy on their branch line. The others laughed at first and called it the Little Western. Duck and Oliver were delighted, and so the Little Western it will always be. Grand Puff and Sleeping Beauty. Okay, I know I'm cheating because this is two episodes, but you can't really do one without the other, so I'm including them both. One late night when all the engines are finding it difficult to fall asleep, Thomas decides to tell the others the story of Duke the Lost Engine. Duke was an old engine that lived on his own railway with two others named Stuart and Falcon. The three were almost a family dynamic, caring for each other, but still getting on each other's nerves and getting into trouble. Whenever they did anything that Duke thought wrong, he would say, that would never suit his grace. But when hard times came, the line was forced to be closed and the engines were sold off and relocated. All except for Duke, who was left in a shed for so long that mudslides and growing nature would bury him and for years he was lost. Winter torrents washed soils from the hills. Trees and bushes grew all around. You wouldn't have known a shed was there let alone a little engine asleep inside. That's not a happy ending, cried Percy. 
Yeah, no it isn't. In the second part, a search team is formed that manages to find the Lost Engine, and Duke is reunited with Stuart and Falcon and put back into service. But the first part ends with Duke being lost without a shred of resolution other than Thomas saying it's not the end of the story. And I find it hilarious that a kid could only see this part and not the second. The narrow gauge engines were such a fun cast of characters being introduced in the fourth season, and they got about two thirds of it dedicated to just them. Most of which don't even mention Thomas, the one the show is named after. That's a level of restraint that wouldn't last. And it's unfortunate because of how great it can be when others are put in the spotlight. This two-parter perfectly captures Thomas's storybook feel while telling a beautiful story about entirely new characters we have never even seen before. The sets are at their all-time high, being jaw-droppingly gorgeous. Like, look at these visuals. It's incredible what they could do with the budgets they had. It also introduced us to not one, but two horrifying fates for engines to end up in. What did he do? He turned him into a generator. He's still out there behind our shed. He'll never move again. Holy fuck! This is for kids? Two of my favorite episodes from when I was little, and two that definitely belong on this list. And that, said Thomas, is the whole story. Did you like it? Yes, indeed, agreed the engines. Especially the happy ending. Toby and the Flood. A powerful storm sweeps across the island of Sodor for several weeks, damaging a water dam on Toby's branch line so badly that it completely breaks apart, causing a massive flood which whisks Toby away down the river, leaving Percy and Harold to scramble to save him before he and his crew go over the waterfall. Would you look at that? Another action-heavy episode from Season 5. I seem to like those. And this episode fits that bill to a T. It's over-the-top, action-packed, and tense as fuck. And I think it works so well. The dam breaking apart and flooding the valley is a genuinely shocking moment. And it looks incredible and makes you fear for the lives of Toby and his crew. And the intense music lifts that simple premise to feel like a serious life or death situation. It's like a disaster movie, and still better than Twister. We also get to see some of the best model work the classic series had to offer. This episode is fucking gorgeous with all the effects they managed to pull off. I'll never get tired of seeing that dam break apart. It's an episode that pushed the boundaries of what was possible on the show, and I'll never get tired of watching it. Certainly one of Thomas's most impressive episodes, and one of the best they ever made. I could never have been so brave, Toby. Oh, I'm sure you would be, but you never know till you've tried. Percy rather hoped he'd never have to. Henry's Forest. Henry the Green Engine loves the forest. It's his happy place, and whenever things start becoming too stressful for him, he can go to relax and feel safe. And he's distraught when a hurricane destroys the forest and its landscape. And seeing how troubled he is by this, Toby, Terence, and Trevor decide to band together to help regrow the trees and make Henry happy again, bringing the forest back to its former glory. Look, Henry, called Terence, we're beginning again. The hillside will look better than ever before, you'll see. This is somewhat of a controversial episode, as Wilbur Audrey, the original writer of the Railway series, famously hated it. As in his words, What, um, interest does a, lo a steam locomotive have in scenery? And he also didn't like how the episode broke typical railway practice. Listen, I love you, Audrey, but didn't you write a story about the same engine being sealed in a tunnel with a brick wall, completely blocking a whole direction of traffic on the main line? Wouldn't exactly call that following railway practice. What happens if they need to use the other tunnel? Are they just fucked? Also, the engines have personalities. I don't think it's crazy to think that some might have interests that don't have to do with them being trains and include the world around them. It's a very interesting idea, in fact, and seeing it done with someone like Henry allows them to show a side of him that we've never seen before, making him a more complex character. It completely changes how you view how he acts towards the other engines. Thomas was always really great at showing different sides to all the engines on Sodor. There are not many of them, at least early on, that feel insanely one note. There seems to always be more to them, some kind of underlying motive that makes them who they are and explains why they do what they do. As much as I love blood pumping episodes that show how creative the team can be, I also love the ones that just take a step back and delve into their characters and be incredibly heartwarming, just as much if not more, and Henry's Forest does exactly that. It's a feel-good episode, and the ending will always make me smile. Now, whenever Henry stops by the forest, he can see the new trees growing strong and tall. Sometimes, everywhere is very quiet, and at other times, Henry can hear leaves rustling, or a bird's wing brushing the air. 
often he can hear the distant sound of children laughing, and always he is happy here. Edward's exploit. This story follows Edward as he tries to get a packed train of Taurus home in a really heavy storm, when one of his crank pins breaks en route leaving him severely damaged with only one working wheel, where he is then tasked with pushing on and getting this heavy train home, and against all odds and pushing to the point of damaging himself even further, he sets off and makes his way back to the station where everybody cheers and thanks him, completely shutting up everybody who doubted him. This is a conclusion to a character arc that started in the second episode. Hell, if you want to go by the book, it was the first story Audrey ever wrote, finally seeing its end. From the very beginning, we see that he's not very well respected by his peers. They see him as old, outdated, and slow, but in reality, he might not be as up to date, but he works just as hard as all of them combined. And this is his greatest trial, the thing that finally makes everybody around him give him the respect he deserves. This was a two-season arc, and the fact that they managed to pull it off with such a satisfying conclusion shows how well-made Thomas is from a writing standpoint. Now, if you ask me, I do think the book's rendition is overall the better story. It has a lot more details about the train Edward is pulling, and the illustrations really convey how bad Edward's situation is, in a way that they couldn't really do with the props. But it still manages to tell the story just fine, and George Carlin's narration and hearing Edward's theme, of course, is one over the book. You've got them! You've got them! And he listened happily to Edward's steady beat as he forged slowly but surely ahead. Duncan gets spooked. In this story, Rusty decides to tell Duncan the tale of the little engine who fell off the old iron bridge. The engine, while attempting to cross it, derailed and tumbled over the side into the swamplands below, and neither he nor his crew were ever seen or found again. But many a workman will tell you that when the moon is full, they have seen the little engine trying to get home, but he never reaches the other side. Thomas had quite a few spooky episodes where they played around with the idea of ghosts, and they were easily some of the most memorable ones they ever made. And it's because they were oddly really good at being creepy and eerie. There was just something unsettling about seeing these models in the darkness with the fog and that sinister score. And of all of them, this one manages to capture that spooky feeling the most with its subject matter, insanely amazing visuals, and an immaculate score to go alongside it. But I think what really makes this episode amazing is its implications about Rusty's story. Usually when children's programming do scary things, they are very quick to assure the audience that the ghost story isn't actually true. It was only a pretend ghost story. Percy was disappointed. It makes sense their audience are small children, but they don't do that here. We never actually get confirmation on whether or not Rusty made up the death of the engine completely, if only parts of the story are true, or if this event happened as he told, because it's very possible. These events aren't outside the realm of possibility, we literally watch it happen on screen. And later when Duncan supposedly sees the outline of the engine, we never actually know if the fireflies making that shape was a coincidence or it's actually the spirit of the little engine trying to communicate with Duncan. Sure, his crew were messed with him, but their only plan was to throw the rock in the ravine and scare him. They couldn't have done this. What, did they turn into Marguerite from Resident Evil 7? Of course, this is a kid's show, I don't think they would do that. But, I don't know. It makes you think, and it's fun to wonder about, and it certainly makes Duncan get spooked an incredibly memorable episode. And Duncan refused to open his eyes. He did though, when he thought his driver wasn't looking, just to make sure that he was still there. And before I get to number one, I want to do some honorable mentions. These are for episodes that either just didn't make the list or I wanted an excuse to talk about. James in a Mess, slash Dirty Objects if you're from the UK. When I think about which episodes I remember from when I was a kid, this one comes to mind almost immediately. To be honest, I couldn't really tell you why. It's such a simple episode, even simple by Thomas standards. Dude makes fun of dude, dude gets instant karma, and dude gets taught a lesson. I think it's just because James was my favorite character for a long time, and I enjoyed seeing him in a huge crash. Thomas, Percy, and the mail train. I wanted to put this on the list so badly, but I couldn't find a good enough reason other than I really like it. It's one of the most nostalgic episodes I remember. The imagery along with the opening narration just takes me back to a simpler time. At night, when the other engines are tucked away in their sheds, you can still hear the faraway call of an engine's whistle and the clickety-clack of train wheels turning. Rusty helps Peter Sam, or trucks, 
Okay, this pick is less because I like it and more because of how much I remember it from when I was younger, because it kind of creeped me the hell out. That's because, for some ungodly reason, the US dub of this episode is missing almost all of its music from the other releases. And the music that is there is insanely depressing. The UK dub and all the others have their music intact just fine. It's only this version that this happened to, and it makes this devastating crash feel extra unsettling. But it was no use. Hurrah, hurrah, roared the trucks. Peter Sam shut his eyes. But it was no use. Hurrah, hurrah, roared the cars. Peter Sam shut his eyes. I'm not crazy, right? I have yet to find somebody who has actually had the same experience down the mine. This episode fascinates me because parts of it include footage from the original 1983 pilot that, at this point, is still lost media. The best shot of it is this one of Thomas going to the mine. I know it's stupid and it wasn't even finished, but I want to see the whole thing so badly. So watching this episode is something I always enjoy. Busy going backwards. This episode proves that the classic series writers could write a story about anything and make it great. This one stars Toad the Brake Van, a background character who only had a couple of lines up until this point. They gave him a starring role in a small character arc where he wishes to go forward, and he gets his wish, just not in the way he wanted. Bye, George. I think this is the funniest episode of Thomas, which is saying a lot. George the Steamroller was introduced in the season before this, and from there to here, he is the most needlessly cruel character in fiction. You swank around with your steamroller wheels, pretending you're as good as me. You're a useless blue puffball. Call yourself a car? You're a disgrace to the road. Find yourself a scrapyard. And then this happens. Get out of my way! But the freight car wouldn't move until Gordon forced it. And even a huge crash, what else do you want? But all right, let's get to number one. All at sea. All at Sea is about Duck the Great Western Engine's love of the sea, and how he dreams of being able to sail away to faraway lands and see what's beyond the horizon. But the issue with that is that he's a steam engine that runs on rails, and he has trouble accepting his limitations and embracing who he is. But after helping an injured person in need get medical attention, he realizes where his strengths are, and maybe he's better off being where he's needed and continuing to dream what's out there rather than actually seeing it with his own eyes. Being a show made for kids, Thomas had a lot of morals to teach at the end of episodes. I mean, not always. There were some where shit just kind of happens. But most of the time, there's always some kind of takeaway lesson to be learned. But something I always enjoyed a lot about Thomas was that the morals were always very interesting and stuff that kids should be taught. It's a lot less of eating your vegetables and more like, stop being a dickhead. And even then, they didn't dumb it down or make it cliche. They tried to show more stuff you're gonna actually see as an adult. Not bad. I've seen worse. At least you're all clean. You see, I know like nine people like that. Although there were some really great bits of flat out mean dialogue. That's my home, replied Toby. That's why I like it, especially when you're there and not here saying I'm silly. The lesson here might be one of the most thought provoking and mature morals I've ever seen a children's show attempt to do. In four and a half minutes too. They don't really try to frame any thought as the right one or try to provide a foolproof solution that would solve everything. No, that's not how life works and they know that. It's a problem that Duck works out by looking inside and seeing what truly matters to him. And that's being useful. And he was probably thinking back to that scene from Spider-Man 2. That's a powerful message for kids, especially because they don't beat you over the head with it. It's subtle. It shows how much respect Thomas had for their audience and why it managed to tell such effective stories. And that ending shot with George Carlin's narration? Ugh, right in my feels. Duck still wonders about the lands beyond the horizon, but I think he knows that sometimes the best travels are those we can only dream about. Don't you? Well, with that finished, are there any you think I missed? Be sure to let me know which ones you think are the best. And if this list made you curious, don't wait. Please give Thomas the Tank Engine a shot. You used to be able to watch it all on YouTube for free, but unfortunately Mattel has been cracking down on that. It's on Amazon Prime, however, and the classic DVDs are dirt cheap if you want the authentic experience. And I really hope you see what I see in it, so I can stop feeling like a crazy person. Chase still wonders if anybody listened to him and went to watch Thomas the Tank Engine. But I think he knows that good stories should and will always be appreciated, no matter where they come from. Don't you?